General John Sim Aguye Iromsin was a Nigerian military official and the first military head of state of Nigeria. He took control of the government amidst the chaotic aftermath of the bloody military coup on 15 January 1966, which resulted in the death of the first Nigerian Prime Minister among other prominent political leaders in the country. Within a brief span of six months in power, Aguye Iromsin would face a counter coup on January 29, 1966, leading to his own death. In today's video, we will learn about John C. Aguye Iromsin and his involvement in bringing an end to the Nigerian First Republic and the democratically elected government, plowing the country into the catastrophic situation we still find ourselves to date. Obehi Ewanfo, the author of the storytelling series for small businesses and content creators. In Obehi podcast, we talk about the power of your story, your narrative, and why you should own your voice. Whether you are a small business owner, a content entrepreneur, or you simply want to build your influence, storytelling is probably going to be your best instrument to connect with your audience. So join the awakened few who are owning their voices. Now let's get started with today's episode. Early Life and Education Aguye Iromsi, known with his full name as Thomas Umunakwe Aguye Iromsi, was born on the 3rd of March 1924 in Ibeku, Umuahia, Abia State. His father is Ezungo Agui. At the tender age of eight, he found himself living with his elder sister, Anyama, who was the wife of Theophilus Johnson, a distinguished diplomat from Sierra Leone, stationed in Umuahia at the time. Together, they became the guiding light in young Iromsi's journey through life. When a child is born, you hold a child in your hand and breath an air of satisfaction that a new world is open to you as if you can almost read the future and foretell what a child will be. But you don't know what that child will become. Maybe that child is going to bring greatness to the family and the community or maybe lead to the demise of the same and you have no way of knowing that. But you must do your best and hope for the better. You would have noticed that Iromsin is referred to as Johnson Aguye Iromsin as if Johnson was the actual son name. Well, that is because he adopted his brother's in law's name, Theophilus Johnson, probably because that was the man he saw as his father's figure and so adopted his name. His military career and rise to prominence. In 1942, at the age of 18, he joined the Nigerian military against the wishes of his sister. Aguirre Ironsi military career began as a private military contractor in the 7th Battalion and he suddenly climbed the rank. In 1946, four years later, he became a company sergeant major, followed by a training course at Staff College in Cambridge, England, which he successfully completed. Subsequently, in 1949, he was promoted to the position of second lieutenant in the Royal West African Frontier Force. His rapid ascent continued, reaching the rank of captain in 1953, and just two years later, in 1955, he was promoted to major. Akuyo Iromsin had the honor of being selected as an equerry for Queen Elizabeth II during her visit to Nigeria in 1956. As a result of his service in this esteemed role, he was awarded member of the Royal Victoria Order MVO distinction. In 1960, Aguirre Iromsin was appointed as a commandant of the 5th Battalion in Kano, Nigeria, holding the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. During the same year, he demonstrated exceptional negotiation skill when he personally secured the release of Australian medical personnel and Nigerian troops who were captured by some rebels in Congo. For this remarkable act, he was awarded 
the Rita Croix Award. Between 1961 and 1962, Aguirre Iromsi served as a military diplomat to the Nigerian High Commission in London, United Kingdom. It was during this period that he was promoted to the rank of Brigadier General. Throughout this time, he also attended various courses at the Imperial Defence College, renowned Royal College of Defence Studies in 1917, located in Seaford House, Bedgrave Square. But what was going to happen next was going to blow everyone out of the water. The bloody coup that led him becoming head of state. On January 15, 1966, a significant event unfolded in Nigeria that would have far-reaching consequences for the country's political landscape. It was a coup d'etat, a sudden and violent overthrow of the government, orchestrated by a group of rebellious soldiers led by Chukwemeka Kadunan Zogu and Emmanuel Ifanjuna. During this fateful day, this determined soldier carried out a bold attack that resulted in the tragic loss of 22 lives. Among the casualties were the Prime Minister of Nigeria, several prominent political figures, and high-ranking army officials, along with their wives. The perpetrator did not hesitate to eliminate those perceived as obstacles to their mission, including the guards who were on protective duties. That was how Aguirre Iromsi became the Nigerian military head of state on January 1966. He was stay in that position until 29 July of the same year, when a group of Northern Army officials would revolt against the government with a counter-coup and key Aguirre Iromsi. The aftermath of this coup and counter-coup sank rock waves throughout Nigeria and the international community, leaving the nation in a state of tumour. It marked a significant turning point in Nigerian history, leading to a series of political upheaval that will shape the country's future for several years to come. In the years that follow, Nigeria experienced various military regimes, instability, and power struggle, altering the trajectory of its government and society. The event of January 15, 1966, have since been widely studied and debated. Different historians, local and international, have analyzed the situation, seeking to better understand the complex web of factors that culminated in this tragic and pivotal moment in Nigerian history. By August 1, 1966, a day after the counter-coup, Lieutenant Colonel Yakubu Gonwon became Nigeria's second military head of state. The echo of that chaotic period attracted a lot of attention across Africa and the world. In an article titled Iromsi, His Mission, Travail and Legacies, available on thenationonline.net, Ruth First, writer of The Barrel of a Gun, was quoted as follows. Within three days of the July outbreak, every Igbo soldier serving in the army outside the East was dead, a prison or flee elsewhere for his life. This is the horrible situation that will eventually precipitate the country into a bloody war leading to the death of more than a million Nigerians in three years. But just out of curiosity, is it possible that these young Nigerian officials knew exactly what they were doing, like a clear plan of action other than the confusion and the ethnic tension that was created? Could it have been acting out a script that was written for them without getting a full picture of what was going to happen? Just thinking. The abolition of regionalism for unitary federalism. The following is a clip from a publication titled Nigeria Unity Federalism and is available at the website of Council on Foreign Relations, Washington, D.C. In May 1966, General Joseph Agui Iromsi Nigeria's first military head of state, also known as Johnny Iron Sai for his exploit in peacekeeping mission in the Congo, promulgated the infamous decree number 34 of 1966, the Unification Decree. The decree effectively did away with the federal system of government practiced since its independence in 1916. What Aguyu Iromsi did in his effort to discourage tribalism and sectional interest was to focus on the urgent task of Nigeria reconstruction. He did this 
by instituting a unitary system of government. It don't see aim to contain regional tension and promote a sense of collective responsibility for the nation's progress. I understand that would need further explanation, so we will come back to it on a separate video. However, why Nigeria as a nation urgently need to revisit its national identity and common dream to take the people along, each state should be able to formulate its individual developmental policies without necessarily depending on the central government, as if the local people were incapable of solving their own problem. After all, if we were copy other systems like the United States after 1963, it would be evident that in those systems, states have a kind of autonomy to be able to formulate their policies. From power generation, trade, employment initiative, food production, and internal security, each of the 36 states of the Nigerian Federation should be able to find a workable solution to their problem instead of the Father Christmas type of federalism currently in place in Nigeria. Again, this need for that clarification, so we need to come back to it on a different video. Going further in the earlier publication, it added that another victim of Nigeria's problematic federal system is the security sector, especially in policy, where the federal government has exclusive power. The inflexibility inherited in the policy system had led to an ineffective force haunted by the issue of poor funding, a history of human rights violation, and an unqualified allegiance to the central government or to the detriment of the people. You can read the full publication for yourself. Coming back to Aguye Iromsin, what lesson can we learn from his story? Legacy and the lesson learned. Yes, there may have been some grievance and reason to take some action, but the coup that brought in Aguye Iromsin as military head of state should never have happened. No, it should never have happened because it was too costly for Nigerians and our nation that needed all the energy to grow up. As a people, we must learn to talk to one another and iron out our grievances because if we fail to do that and fight one another, we will still come back to the round table after we have destroyed lives and property. So was it not better to avoid the casualties? You see, we study history not because we want to return to the past, but so that we can learn from our mistakes and look for ways to grow beyond them. This surely was a costly mistake and we certainly must learn from it and grow beyond it. this podcast please subscribe so you never miss any of our future episodes rate and review overhead podcast and share with your friends who might need it thank you so much for listening i talk to you in the next episode